Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Welcome, my name is Adrian Harewood from CBC Ottawa and also Our Ottawa, and it is a delight for me to be hosting this Writers' Fest event. When we examine our history, we re realize that war has been with us for much of the time that human beings have been on the earth, and for all the progress that we think we have made over the centuries and millennia, it haunts us still. War has left an imprint on all of us. The question is, what kind of imprint is it? How has it affected us? Margaret Macmillan is among Canada's foremost historians. Indeed, she is one of the most celebrated historians of her generation. Professor of History at the University of Toronto, an Emeritus Professor of International History, and the former Warden of St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. Her many books include Women of the Raj, Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, for which she was the first woman to win the Samuel Johnson Prize, and was also awarded the Governor General's Literary Award. Nixon in China, Six Days That Changed the World, uh, The War That Ended the Peace, and also History's People. Her most recent book is entitled War, How Conflict Shaped Us, and Margaret McMillan joins us now. Margaret, thanks so much for joining us. I'm delighted. I'd rather be in Ottawa itself, but it's great to do it virtually. Margaret, in the introduction to your book, War, How Conflict Shapes Us, we learn something about your own family and its connection uh, to war. We, you tell us that both of your grandfathers uh, were in the First World War, both serving as, as doctors. Uh, you also say that your, your, your father was in the Second World War, along with your, your four uncles. And, and I'm curious as to how you think war has shaped your family. Well, like a lot of families in the 20th century, war has affected us because the 20th century has seen some of the biggest wars in, in human history, and, and both in their totality, but also because they were global wars. And so I think if you ask most people, they will have some connection in some way to a war somewhere or other in the 20th century. And I'm of the generation, it's a generation which will disappear fairly soon, that actually knew people who fought in the First World War. And perhaps that's one of the reasons I got interested, because I heard stories from my grandfathers, and then I heard stories from my father, who was in the Canadian Navy in the Second World War. And so the fact that war existed and that people we knew had been in it was something you just grew up with in, in my generation. What did you learn about war from your grandfathers? What did they teach you? Well, it was interesting. They didn't want to talk about it very much. Um, my Canadian grandfather, who was went over to, 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 to be on the Western Front as a doctor, didn't talk much about it. He brought back souvenirs and including a hand grenade, which we used to play with as children um, until someone realized that it seemed to still have a pin in it, um, which was not a good thing. He talked more to my sister, actually. Um, she was younger, and, and she said she now feels guilty that she cannot remember the sorts of things he was telling her very much. That it often is the case that grandparents do talk to grandchildren, but in my case, my grandfather, Canadian grandfather, talked to my sister. My British grandfather who was at Gallipoli and then again um, in, in what was then called Mesopotamia, today's Iraq, talked a little bit about it. And I have some stories of that. And I heard stories, of course, from my parents who had heard perhaps a little bit from their, their parents as well. And what did your father then tell you about, about his, his experience in the Second World War? Well, when we were children, he told us funny stories. Um, he told us stories which were, were sort of the sort of stories children would like. Um, how he was a doctor on a Canadian ship, an anti-aircraft ship. And he, he, there was a craze for raising canaries, for example. And so we liked those stories. Only once did he tell us about a very near escape he'd had. Um, he had. He was on a ship. They were doing a convoy. There was a terrific battle on the way across the Atlantic. And a bomb came straight for his ship and, and, ship and, and just missed it. And he, he did get rather emotional. And that was the only time he ever talked about the more terrifying side of war. I think for a lot of people, they would rather forget about the war and, and talking about the memories can often be very painful, particularly the difficult memories. So as a young person, was war a source of horror for you or, or, or were you always kind of fascinated by it? I think it was both. And perhaps when you're young, you don't take in the horror 
I mean, I think of the way in which young children, and, and we certainly did read horrific fairy tales where people get chopped up and baked in pies and terrible things happen. And for some reason, when you're a child, it doesn't seem all that real. So when I was younger, I thought it was always fascinating. I liked the stories of heroes. I liked the stories of glory. As I got older, of course, and began to realize what war was really like, I found it enormously disturbing. But as an historian, I also found it fascinating because it has been such a force in, in shaping history and shaping the world in which we live. And it's been a, so much of your own professional life. You, you, a lot of your work has dealt with the subject of, of war. And I'm curious as to why you wanted to write this particular book, War, How Conflict Shaped Us. What, what kind of questions were you trying to answer with this book? I think I, I came to it because I'd been dealing with war and so much of else of what I did. I mean, I taught the history of the 19th and 20th centuries and wrote about it. And war comes in so often and, and war affects societies in so many ways. And so I was always conscious of the importance of war. And, and when I taught at Ryerson in Toronto, I started a course which I developed called War and Society, which I found interesting and it drew me deeper into the subject. And then I was asked to give the wreath lectures for the BBC, which is the equivalent of, of the Massey lectures for the CBC. And they said, what would you like to talk about? And I thought this might be a time to get my thoughts together on a subject which I've dealt with in passing and dealt with quite often, but never dealt with head on. And so I lectured on war and that then grew into this book. So it was a chance for me to sort out my own thoughts on what I thought about war. And of course, when I did the book, I learned a great deal more than I, than I expected I would. So what do you know now that you didn't know when you first began this project about about war? One of the things I'd never properly reflected on was the ways in which wars affected the development of, of big units, big political units, you know, empires, countries. Germany came together as a country partly because of war. The Roman Empire was built by war and, and was maintained partly by military force. And so the impact that war had simply on the development of particular forms of government and the fact that government became more centralized in the modern age because of the need partly to deal with war. The, you know, making war is very complicated and very demanding and you have to be very well organized and you have to extract resources from society and, and organize armed forces. And so I found that I hadn't quite realized the impact that war has had on, on many of our institutions. And so that was something I, I found. And, and then I got very interested in subjects like war and gender. Why is it? that probably 99.9% .9 of those who have ever fought in history have been men. And what, what is the role of women in war? I mean, these were subjects which I was able to explore more fully and found absolutely fascinating. We're going to get to that, but, but I did want to talk about your first chapter, because in the first chapter called Humanity, Society and War, you say that, that human beings you know, first appeared on the earth 350,000 years ago, and that for much of the 20th century, those who studied uh, those nomadic peoples believe that they lived a peaceful ex existence, but in fact, that assumption is wrong. Can you tell us about that? What's the evidence for that? Well, the assumption may not be wrong, but I think it's been challenged. And I tend to think that the challenges have some validity. Um, you know, there is a view that there was this sort of Garden of Eden where people lived in perfect harmony and, and simply had enough food to eat. They could move on when they ran out of anything and they lived in harmony with each other. And the evidence, I think, as archaeology has pushed back the borders of what we know, and it's become possible to do things like testing ancient DNA and examining very ancient skeletons, I think we've become more aware of the role of violence in the past. Um, that, you know, centuries and millennia ago, they are finding graves where every single person has been killed. And this does not look like someone who just died from an accident. This looks purposive. And certainly the earliest evidence we have of human settlement when people began to settle down is that when they settled down, they of course had more to defend because they were engaged in agriculture. They started to build walls. And why were they building walls? Because they were being attacked by someone else. And so I think as far back as we can tell, conflict has been part of human society. It's not the only part, but it has been a factor in human society. So would you say then that, that it's human nature, that, that human beings then have a propensity for violence? They have a, a penchant for war? Well, this is a huge debate, um, and you've touched on one of the biggest debates in, in the whole field. Um, I don't believe in, in the biological explanation. I think we certainly are creatures um, shaped by our biology. 
And I think we probably have an instinct um, that makes us want to flee or fight when we were frightened. Um, that I think is a very deep instinct. But that's not the same as war. I mean, the sort of random violence you get when two people get angry and they start punching each other is not really what war is. War is highly organized. War is people not fighting each other until they're told to do so. War is people fighting in groups. War is purposive, people fighting for a purpose. And so whatever aggressive instincts we have, I don't think really explain why we get war. I think what is extremely important is culture. I think we, we can see in history cultures where making war was something that was not only expected as something that governments did, governments saw it as a tool that they could use, but making war was something that people were trained to do by their own societies and cultures. And so you get throughout history, warrior cultures, Sparta, for example, where young men, and it was almost always young men, were brought up to be brave, to be prepared to die in battle. And so I think cultural factors are probably even more important than biological factors because they help to explain why people go into war willingly and are willing to risk their own deaths. You just alluded to this, but perhaps you can just set the parameters for us when it comes to war. Because, for example, in, in the media here in Canada, we, we hear about the, the motorcycle gang wars between the rock machine and, 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 the, and the Hells Angels. We hear, we hear war use, in, you kind of, war use in, in, in a very kind of um, cavalier way, perhaps. We, we tend to bandy the term about. So what exactly is war and what isn't war? Are motorcycle wars real wars? I would say they are because they involve organized groups who are fighting for a purpose and whether that's to control the lucrative illegal trade of some sort or to defend themselves. Um, I think it's the organization and the purpose that makes war and, and the group fact. But we do use the language, as you rightly pointed out, very, very loosely. I mean, we talk about the war on obesity. We talk about the war on the COVID. We talk about the war on poverty. I mean, this is, these, these are metaphors and I don't see these as real wars. And you get politicians, of course, who talk about themselves as war leaders leading the war against such and such when they're not actually leading a real war. So I would define war really very specifically as organized violence by groups to achieve a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. Are we becoming less violent or more violent? Oh, this is a huge debate. I mean, Steven Pinker really set off something. The, the um, academic at Harvard, when he argued in The Better Angels of Our Nature and, and other writings that we have become steadily less violent. And he points to homicide rates. He points to the fact that we no longer have public spectacles of executions, for example. We no longer tolerate things like bear baiting or dog fighting. I mean, we, we have perhaps become gentler in the way in which we deal with things, but it's very hard to tell. I mean, that his, his figures have been disputed. And when you look around the world, if we're becoming less violent, then why do we have so many wars? You think of the wars that go on and have been going on around the world since 1945. An awful lot of people have died in war since the end of the Second World War. So I'm not sure we're becoming less violent. I think certain societies are less likely to go to war. In Sweden, which we now know is a rather gentle place, with some peace-loving Swedes who, who like wandering in the woods and picking berries and so on. In the 18th century, Sweden was a terrifying country. And if you heard the Swedish soldiers were coming anywhere near the town, you, you, you barricaded yourselves in and you got out of the way because they were utterly ruthless. So Sweden has changed, societies change, but are we as a species becoming less violent? I don't think so. Can you take us through just the development of war and, 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 and kind of touch on maybe some of the key moments in, in, in the evolution of war? Well, I think perhaps two things go hand in hand, and one is the ability to organize, you know, to get the troops, to, to get the soldiers, to get the sailors, uh, more recently to get the people who will fly or go under the sea, um, to get them, to train them. And the second thing, of course, is, is to get the equipment they need, because they're no good without any equipment. And so the development of war, I think, has gone along with the, develop of, the development of organization, but also, of course, what's made a huge difference to war to, to, to war is the sorts of things that you fight war with. And there've been a number of huge event, huge sort of moments in, in the development of warfare. The, the arrival of the horse, for example, out of Central Asia made it possible for people who wanted to fight to move much more quickly to overwhelm those who were still on the ground. And so the horse gave mobility, it gave the capacity to, to scatter if, if they weren't careful troops on the ground. Um, you've got the development of the bow, which made it possible to kill people from further away. 
And then, of course, you've got the development of, of much better steel. And then in, in the early modern age, the development of gunpowder, which was going to make a huge difference to the ways in which war were fought. So technology at various stages plays a real difference and makes a real change in ways in which war are fought. But of course, a huge period of adjustment, you know, new divides along and it takes a while for people to get used to it. But that's still happening. You know, we, we now see war moving into cyberspace because of new technology and everyone's trying to figure out what this is going to mean for war. You, you talk about the various reasons, the various causes of, of war. You, 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 you talk about abductions, you say romances, uh, religion, fabrications, Im imperialism. Can you tell us about some of the, the kind of, you know, common and conventional reasons why war has begun and, and also, you know, address some of the more bizarre reasons for, for wars breaking out? Well, I think people will find excuses for a war when they want to. And there have been some very bizarre ones. I mean, there's the famous British one, the War of Jenkins' Year, where a sea captain claimed that his year was cut off by the Spanish and he carried this horrible little thing around in a handkerchief for years, talking to anyone who'd listen. And the British government actually wasn't that much interested because it didn't want a war with Spain at that point until it did. And suddenly, Captain Jenkins' ear became a tremendous blow against national pride. And the British mm. demanded that the Spanish back down. And the Spanish said no. And then there was a war. So the excuses for wars can often be very, very what, what seemed to us trifling. But I think when you actually boil it down, when you when you look at why people are fighting. My view is it comes down to about three different things. Um, I think groups of people, and sometimes individuals, fight out of greed. They want something. They want loot. They want to you know, take someone's family prisoner. They want to take slaves. They want to take over land. They fight out of fear. Someone's trying to take what I have, and so I will sometimes fight. Or I fight because I'm afraid they're going to exterminate me. Fear is a very powerful motivating force. And then I think the third sort of general group is, is sort of ideas, what I call roughly ideas and ideology. People fight for a cause. The soldiers who fight mistakenly, for, I think, for ISIS um, fight, or Daesh fight because they think they're going to build a, a different sort of world and that they will see the triumph of, of their particular brand of Islam. Um, people who fought for the Bolsheviks. Uh, who became the communists in Russia, fought because they were trying to build a better society. And sometimes people fight out of pride. Um, you can see that again in, in fights that, you know, the gangs have. I've been disrespected, I've been dishonored, and so I'm going to fight. And so I think, you know, you can't say that war is about any one thing. I think it, it usually is a combination, but I think the three main factors are, are greed, fear, and ideas and ideology. You, you say in the book that, that war changed in, in the 18th and 19th century. We, we see the kind of emergence of, of modern war. Uh, and, and you attribute that to uh, the Industrial Revolution and, and also nationalism. Can, can you explain? Yeah, well, I think what the Industrial Revolution did is make possible to have very large armies and navies and to keep them supplied. Because before the Industrial Revolution, before you got trains, before you got mass production of food before you got the mass production of things like guns and, and uniforms. Armies used to run out of supplies and then they'd have to stop fighting. And you couldn't keep an army in one place for very long because you couldn't keep it supplied with enough food. I mean, armies would literally, like locusts, eat the countryside bare. And once they'd run out of food, they'd have to move on or starve. Once you got the Industrial Revolution, it became possible to build large armies and keep them, and big navies, and keep them in the field or at sea for much longer. What nationalism did, I think, is weld societies together with this notion that they're all part of the same very large family, in a sense. And it gave the motivation. People felt that they ought to fight for their countries. And so where in the 18th century, soldiers, ordinary soldiers were seen as the scum of the earth, um, you didn't put good people into the army because you really just wanted cannon fodder. By the 19th century, fighting for your country was seen as an obligation because you felt yourself to be part of the nation. And so I think the Industrial Revolution and, and this changing relationship between people and their country came to produce what we think of as modern war, war on a very large scale and war that often goes on for a long time. And, and you, you say that the soldiers who fought in Napoleon's army were different kinds of soldiers. This was a, this was a fundamentally different army than anything that we'd seen before. I think it was, and I think that shows the force of nationalism. And what the French Revolution did is get rid of a type of government where the monarch was absolute, 
and where you were the subject, you weren't a citizen, you were just the subject, and you did what the king or the queen told you to do. With the French Revolution, the French, in theory at least, took responsibility for their own government. And so the government belonged to them, but that also meant they had an obligation to the government. And the revolution was something which a lot of people, not all by any means, but a lot of people in, in France supported with great fervor. And so the conventional European armies at the time that had to fight against these new French armies from the French Revolution were horrified because the French came rushing across the field. They didn't seem to worry about dying. They sang revolutionary songs. You could march them at night because you didn't have to worry about them running away because they were, they were motivated by the cause. And so, yes, I think it was a different kind of army that made an appearance. And initially, at least, it carried all before it. I mean, it was very difficult for the old style armies to deal with it. And, and it, it, I guess it fundamentally changed the relationship between the citizenry and the state, did it not? But be, because the citizenry felt a kind of sense of responsibility. But at the same time, the, the state also then has a responsibility to explain itself in some ways to the citizens. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to ask your citizens to fight in your armies or ask them to make sacrifices for war, and of course, the more complicated war became, the more everybody in society was involved. You know, when the men went off to fight, the women went into the factories to, to take on the jobs and the other sorts of jobs that, that men had been doing. And so governments did indeed find that they had to do more to think about their citizens. And they had to, if they were thinking about war, whether to defend themselves or to attack their, their neighbors, they had to think about having good soldiers. And so they began to worry about things like public health, about feeding people properly, about educating their soldiers properly, their citizens properly. So a lot of the impetus behind social and medical and sanitary reforms in the 19th century came from the need to create good potential material for the armies and the navies. And, and the states then are, are kind of actively involved in, in figuring out ways to convince the citizens why this is the right war, why this is a good war to, to, to fight. In, in 1914, you, you, you state in your book, you know, there was concern that there was too much peace that there was, a, there was a softening of society and a lot of talk about how a good conflict every so often toned up a nation's moral fiber and made, quote, tough patriots out of yeah. the, its young. How did, how did governments manage to convince, you know, millions and millions of people that they needed to fight to be, to, to kind of almost demonstrate their masculinity in some way? Well, I think it's partly through education. It's the sorts of things they're taught in the schools. I mean, the, the, all the histories being taught in Europe before 1914 were national histories. In other words, school children in Germany learnt German history, French children learnt French history, British children learnt British history. And those histories tended to be about the past glories. You know, we are a great nation and we were a great nation in the past and we're going to be a great nation in the future. And so education was something which I think helped to inculcate, or so governments hoped, a spirit among the, um, among the young that they would be prepared to go and fight and die for the country. But there were also lots of volunteer groups. I mean, there were lots of people in society who set up things like the Boy Scouts. And the Boy Scouts, I bet if you were ever a Boy Scout, but they, they used to take an oath to defend king and country. And a lot of what they were learning, pathfinding, making knots, first aid, was designed to turn them into future soldiers. And a number of countries had organizations like this. And you've got pressure groups, you've got Navy leagues, Army leagues, and a lot of sort of celebrating of past glories, um, celebrating past victories. And so it wasn't just governments doing it. I think there was also a good deal of sort of amateur and, and volunteer participation from society as well. And, and you yourself, as a young girl, were, were somewhat involved in that, were you not, as a brownie? You, 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 you talk about the fact that you were learning all kinds of songs that, 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 that taught you yeah. the importance of a, a certain kind of patriotism. Yeah. Well, we, we, we didn't realize we were doing it as brownies. I mean, you know, but we, we, were, we, we used to sing, and I now recognize World <laughs> War I songs, and we'd sing things like, you know, The Quartermaster's Store and Mademoiselle from Arm and Tears, not the original versions. I mean, I've since, I have a friend who collects soldiers' songs from the First World War, and they were not the sort of things brownies were singing, I can tell you. They were much, <laughs> much ruder. Right. But, and we learned how to do, I mean, it was interesting. In brownies, you, you, were, you were meant to be um, a good support for those who, who, who might be going to war. And so we learned how to make bandages and we learned how to do cooking and we got badges for doing things like that. Quite interesting, the sort of gender difference now, I think, back. You, you say that, that human beings sometimes start wars because of the triffles. What, what, what are the triffles? 
Well, sometimes we start, we, we don't always start wars for great causes. Sometimes we start a war because we feel we've been insulted. We sometimes start a war because someone has done something. And we sometimes start wars by accident. You know, I've, I've, I've come to think that the First World War almost started by, by accident. If the Archduke hadn't got an assassination and people hadn't got themselves into positions where it was difficult to back down, it's one, it's, you know, I think the role of pride and prestige plays an enormous part. And countries like individuals will get themselves into positions in which it is very difficult to back down. And so I think, yes, I think sometimes wars can start for small reasons, um, sometimes what seem like very stupid reasons. The trouble is once they start, um, it's ending them that becomes the problem, and that is not easy. Are some wars inevitable? You, you, you mentioned the term Thucydides' trap, and, and you, you, you mm -hmm. cite the fact that in, in, in the, this current you know, world order, the, the rivalry between the United States and, and, and China you know, should concern us somewhat, and, and that perhaps this is leading, it, it could lead to a very bad end. Yeah, well, the, the Thucydides trap, I always have trouble saying it, is based on, on a, one comment that Thucydides, the, the great Greek historian, made in the Peloponnesian War, his history of the Peloponnesian War, and that is that Sparta feared the growing power of Athens and therefore resolved to wage war on it. And so that's become a theory that when a rising power faces a declining power, war is likely because the rising power will, will challenge the declining power and the declining power will want to try and stop the rising power from becoming any more powerful. And I'm not sure it works like that. I mean, I think there are enough, I mean, it, it's a danger, but there are also examples in history of where a declining power has actually come to terms with the rising power. I mean, the British Empire and the United States talked about going to war in, in the 1890s how seriously, I don't know. But there was certainly talk of war in, in, in both London and Washington. And both sides decided to back down and come to an agreement. And I think that's also possible. And what worries me about the current application of the whole Thucydides trap idea to China and the United States is if you start to think it's inevitable, then you start to behave like it is. And I think that can be very dangerous. Once you get, and we've already got it, people in China in the military for example, and people in the American military making plans for the war they might have one day, then I think it becomes a little bit that much more likely. You know, speaking of China, you talked earlier about how culture matters when it, when it comes to, to war. Um, you, you say that in the book that, that in Rome, in ancient Rome, uh, Rome had a culture of war. But whereas in classical China, despite the fact that there were many great generals, you know, military valor was never elevated above civilian uh, valor. Fight, fighting was not venerated in the same way that it was in, in Rome, and, and that war was actually regarded as a sign of, of a, a kind of a breakdown in order and propriety. Can you expand on that? Yeah, well, I think the Chinese early on developed the idea that if you could avoid fighting, it was better. Um, Sun Tzu, the great Chinese str strategic thinker, said, you know, the general who can win a victory without fighting is a great general. And if you can win over your enemies by deception, by trickery, good. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing honorable in, in sort of charging into the mouths of, of the other side's guns or swords or whatever and getting yourself killed in a futile way. And I think early on in China, although certainly over the centuries, Chinese empires did an awful lot of fighting and they had many great generals. Those who could build without resorting to war and those who could gain power without resorting to war came to be valued. And the scholar became seen as, as someone who was the epitome of Chinese society. And, and the most powerful people in China, those who worked for the government, were the scholars, those who, who underwent a very rigorous training. And so to have the scholar's gown was much more important than to have a general's uniform. Mm -hmm. The decision makers, the architects of war, sometimes underestimate uh, how war can have its own momentum. Um, you, you, you talked about the, the, the war in Iraq and, and how there was a real underestimation of how um, war has its almost its, its own kind of energy. And, and this, this idea that human beings can control war somehow once it starts is a bit foolhardy. I completely agree. I think once a war starts, a lot of things change. Well, first of all, war, war, war can never be neatly planned. 
all the best plans go awry. I think it was Wellington who said no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. And I think war is full of accidents, surprises, unexpected events. And I think once the casualties begin to mount and once passions are engaged on both sides, then it becomes much more difficult to back down. I mean, I think one of the reasons the First World War lasted so long was that it was almost impossible for governments to say by Christmas 1914 to their own people, um, we've made a bit of a mistake here. We thought we could promise you victory and we're not going to get it. A lot of people have died. A lot more people are going to die. Let's just stop now. I mean, that was unthinkable because, of course, the argument, and it was the same argument that many Americans made about staying in Vietnam, we have to justify all the losses. We can't back down now. And so war, once it starts, I think, is something that is, is not easily controlled and where it will end up, I think, cannot be easily predicted. And I think the Iraq invasion occupation is, is a very good example of that, made worse, I think, by the fact that the coalition partners, the United States and Britain, really didn't think beyond what would happen once they toppled Saddam Hussein. They didn't think what might happen then. And they made what was already a very bad situation into a catastrophe simply by failing to plan what would happen once they'd achieved the particular goal of getting rid of Saddam Hussein. And Iraq is still paying the penalty for that and the price for that. We, we know that war causes massive destruction. Uh, we, we know that the, the tens of millions of people uh, in the 20th century were, were, were killed as a result of war. Uh, it causes tremendous pain and trauma. But you also know that, that, that war is also responsible for innovation. Uh, war is responsible for some of the kind of technological advances and other advances, societal advances. Can you, can you speak to that as well? Yeah, as I, I, it's a very interesting thing. It's sort of a paradox. And, and we, you know, we wouldn't make war in order to achieve great technological advances, but war does force through things that in peacetime just seem impossible. Um, very near where I, where I am at the moment in Oxford, there's a plaque on a wall of what used to be a hospital saying, this is the place that penicillin was first successfully used to treat a person who was dying. And it was in 1941, the first successful use. Penicillin had been discovered in the interwar years. Everybody knew that it could probably save lives, but it was seen as too expensive to make. The war came, Second World War came, suddenly penicillin is no longer too expensive to make. And so things become possible in war that are not possible necessarily in peacetime. And often these are things that will then benefit civilian societies afterwards. When you think of the millions of lives that have been saved by penicillin and things that are speeded up as a result of war, the jet engine comes out of the Second World War. Uh, transistors and the internet came out of the Cold War. And so war can produce unexpected benefits. And it can also, I think, improve societies, particularly big major wars, by leveling off the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, the rich get taxed more heavily, the poor get treated better because they're an important part of the war effort. And so you often get real social progress as a result of war. And of course, as a woman, I know that you know for women, their position has been improved um, often by war. Not always, I mean, women also suffer particular horrors in war, but women got the vote in a number of countries after the First World War in recognition of the fact that they had contributed to the war effort. And so, as I say, we wouldn't go to war to try and bring about progress, but sometimes war has these unintended and, and beneficial consequences. You know, I can think of a couple of other examples. For example, the, the influence that, the impact that the, the GI Bill uh, in the United States had on, on, on the, the ability of, of millions of Americans to, to go to school, to go to university, yeah. uh, the, the, yeah. kind, the, the kind of effects that it had on, on the, uh, you know, people's well, wealth, like in, in terms of in, in terms of their economic well-being, that GI yeah. Bill was critical. Yeah. Yeah. I think what the GI Bill did was open the door to higher education for all sorts of people who simply wouldn't have been able to think about it before the Second World War. And it was, I think, hugely important. And of course, it contributed and unlocked a whole lot of human talent mm -hmm. and contributed to the real growth, um, both in material terms, but also in, in research and, and technology in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, I think that was absolutely enormously important. One of the great medical innovators of, of the uh, 20th century uh, was Norman Bethune, a uh, Canadian. Can, can you speak about what he contributed as a result of, of his engagement in the war? Yeah, well, one, one of the, the problems always in treating battlefield wounds, I mean, the, the, you know, if you are 
badly injured on the battlefield, it's very important to get medical treatment right away. And one of the crucial problems was managing to give people who'd lost a lot of blood, blood transfusions. And, and it simply had, wasn't possible until Norman Bethune came up with a way of doing battlefield blood transfusions. And this made a huge difference. It meant that people were getting treatment much more quickly on battlefields and, and therefore had a much better chance of survival. I think it was one of his, his really significant contributions. War has also been a way in which communities, even marginalized communities, have, have tried to prove their worth, have, have tried to prove their worth as citizens. I think of, for example, the African Canadians who fought in, in, the, in the First World War, the African Americans who were fighting in the, in the First and Second World War, trying to show that they deserved full citizenship. Uh, can, can you talk about the role that, that war has played in, the, in those kinds of struggles? Yeah, I think, well, I think war has brought an opportunity for groups that have been marginalized and oppressed and not seen as, as properly part of us or, or majority society. And I think for a lot of such groups, war has been an opportunity to show that they, they can actually contribute. I mean, very interestingly, in, in the First World War, and I didn't know this when I started doing my book, a lot of Irish nationalists who had been fighting with their, you know, to the utmost to try and get the British out of Ireland, volunteered to fight for the British forces in the First World War because they thought if we can show the British that we Irish care passionately about our country, that we are prepared to contribute to the victory in the First World War, then they will give us our independence. And so you do get this. You, you, you get soldiers from the colonies around, around the world the, of the big European empires thinking that if they can show that they can contribute to the war, if it, it, it will make the dominant power treat them differently. And I think it's, yes, I think the, the African-Americans who volunteered to fight in the First World War and Second World War, the Japanese-Americans who volunteered to fight in the Second World War, the indigenous in Canada who fought in both wars, I think for a lot of them, this was an opportunity to show that they were claiming full participation in the society that they were part of, and they wanted to be treated as full members of that society because they'd earned it. Yeah. You, you talk about the paradox, and you've mentioned that in, in our conversation. And I'm just quoting you here. You say, one of the great tragedies of modern war was that the very strengths of societies could turn them into such effective killing machines. It is, it is one of the great ironies. And if you look at Europe before the First World War, it was in so many ways the center of the world. I mean, not just dominant politically through its empires, but dominant economically. Europe was where you went if you wanted to get money for investment. It was European goods that were, were, were selling all over the world. It was Europeans who were leading in science and technology. I mean, Europe was you know, the most important part of the world. And the Europeans themselves were very conscious of this and thought wrongly that this meant that they were also the most civilized part of the world. And for a lot of Europeans, the idea that they would fight in a major war became more and more improbable. They were too civilized for that. And I think that is one of the, the tragedies that hit Europe and indeed the world in, in 1914, that this enormously prosperous, organized, productive part of the world used its tremendous wealth and its tremendous capacity to fight a war that went on for four years, over four years. And I think it, it, it is, I think, one of the great ironies that the very strengths of European society, its capacity to mobilize people, its capacity to organize, its tremendous capacity to produce the goods that were needed for war, meant that it locked itself into a war that was going to destroy a lot of that capacity. We, we know that war reveal, uh, can reveal some very ugly things about societies and, and, and communities. Yeah. You, 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 you note that, that cultures that admire war uh, tend to disparage enemies who do not share the same values or, or virtues. And, and you, you talk about, you know, the British having stereotypes about, about Bengalis in India, uh, and they regarded them as, as effeminate. Uh, and and they, they much preferred, you know, more martial cultures like the Gurkhas. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there were a lot of sort of crackpot theories about what they called the different races. I mean, this was a term they used in, in, in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries. Often they simply meant different ethnicities, although sometimes they were actually racial. And, and the, you know, one of the theories was that people who lived in cold climates tended to be tougher than people who lived in warm climates, uh, which ignores the fact, of course, that the ancient Egyptians who lived in a very war, warm climate were incredible soldiers. And, and so indeed, were, 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 you know, so, so indeed were, were the Zulus in southern, in southern Africa. 
But there were these theories, and the British tended to think that Muslims were more likely to be good fighters than Hindus, as well as people who came from, from the cooler parts of India. Um, you know, this, this was not based on any scientific fact whatsoever, but th these things became deeply ingrained. Having said that, I do think you get societies in which martial values are passed down from generation to generation, so that, for example, among Gurkhas, for a very long time, being a soldier was an honorable thing, and sons would try and follow their fathers because that's what was expected of them. And you certainly got it among the upper classes in Germany before the First World War. The Prussian Junkers, for example, the sort of landed gentry, where young men were brought up to be extremely brave, not to complain if they hurt themselves, um, and that the most honorable thing they could do was go and fight for their country. So, you know, I think cultural values can, can be enormously important, but the idea that some peoples are better at fighting than others by some reasons of climate or, or biology, I think, just simply doesn't hold any water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um you know, one one thing that, that when you look at, for example, the the war historiography, particularly in um, in North America and, and Europe, it, there seems to be a lot of gaps. And and when I say that, I mean there there seems to be a lack of coverage of things like, for example, the Malayan War or or the the the, the, the Kenyan War for for independence in the nineteen fifties. Uh, and and there seems to be a kind of. Uh, uh, maybe sometimes a kind of a reluctance to tell the stories of the marginalized and as a result kind of not recognize how war has shaped them as well. Do, do you, would you concur with that? Um, I think we're, yes, I would partly. I think we're always very, we're selective in what we study about the past and we tend to study things that seem to involve us, first of all. And so if you're living in Canada, you probably are going to be more interested in Canadian participation in the two world wars and in Korea in the 20th century, then you might be in the Chinese Civil War, for example, even though we should be interested in it. I think, you know, we, we tend to sort of look first at what affects us. Um, but it is true, you know, and I think it also just sometimes subjects just aren't explored all that well. And the Kenyan, the, what was then called the Mau Mau uprising, which the British put down, we now know with considerable ferocity and, and, a, and a disregard for sort of ordinary values of law and order. And, and, and we now know more about it, thanks in part to historians who've gone into the records and found out what happened. And, and it's been quite a struggle because the British government tried to keep a lot of those records secret. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it takes a certain amount of digging and it will take historians to try and get into the subject. And I think you know, there, there are all sorts of things we should, I think, know more about. I mean, so much of what's been written about Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam, is written from the American perspective. And we don't know enough, or I don't think I know enough, certainly, about what the Vietnamese were thinking, um, both the Vietnamese in the South and the Vietnamese in the North, and what, what their views were. I mean, we're making some progress on this, and, and there's been a very couple of really good books recently using Vietnamese language sources. But, you know, I think, I think there will always be areas that we need to explore more. And I think we're sometimes driven by what interests us at a particular moment. Mm -hmm. The global arms trade is a huge business. I, I think $420 billion in arms sales every single year. Is it not the case that war is fought because it makes money? It, it's, it's profitable. Well, war makes money for some people, doesn't it? Um, it makes money for those who, who manufacture the things that are needed in war. And they don't actually need wars. I mean, I think it's sometimes said that the arms manufacturers produce wars. I think actually they do just as well if there's a state of armed tension. Um, before the First World War, a lot of the big arms manufacturers were selling to both sides. And once the war started, of course, they could only sell to one side. So, I mean, I think in their, it, 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 it's in their interest to keep sales up, but they don't necessarily need a war to do it. But it is a huge business. And, you know, all countries in the world, industrial countries in the world are engaged in it. Um, you know, Canada, we think we're a nice peace-loving country and we contrib contribute to UN peacekeeping activities, but we do sell the things that are needed to make war and, and it does produce jobs in Canada. And, you know, this is, this is a complicated argument and governments will make the point that we need jobs. And if we sell things to, for example, Saudi Arabia that will be used um, for purposes we don't approve of, well, it's producing jobs in Canada. I mean, these are not easy questions, and I think we should be careful before we, we say, you know, everyone's awful except us. I, th I think, you know, in a way, all industrial countries tend to do rather well out of selling the, the, the means to make war 
You said in this conversation that 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 ninety nine percent of of soldiers in wars have have been men, but but you do cite a number of examples in your book uh, about women who were uh, warriors. Uh, you, you you cite, for example, the the so called Amazons of Dahomey in 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 West yeah. Africa uh, yeah. as being as being great warriors. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that particular story? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the fact that women can be and have been in the past, we, we now know more about it, have been soldiers, really is, is an argument on the side of saying that it's really about culture, that war is about culture and what's expected of people. And if women are expected to stay home and tend the fires, then they won't become warriors. But if they're expected to become warriors, they will. And in Dahomey, in the 18th century, a very rich kingdom, um, gold, slavery, you know, very rich kingdom on the west coast of Africa, the king, the story is that the king was short of troops in the face of an enemy. And so he dressed up some women in his palace in um, warrior's clothes and passed them off as men. And then realized, in fact, that they were very good soldiers. And so the kings of Dahomey up until the 19th century had an elite bodyguard made up of women. And there are actually some photographs of these women and there's some descriptions of them. And they were trained to fight. They were extremely effective. Um, French soldiers who fought against them said they, they were you know, terrifying in battle because they, they were fearless, they were ruthless, and they were, you know, I think, a very good example of the ways in which warriors aren't born um, but are made by the cultures in which they live. You talk about war being a mystery, but, but it seems as if you've kind of figured it out. Are, do you still find it mysterious? And, and what do you find mysterious about war at this stage? Well, I think what I find mysterious about it is our own feelings towards it. You know, that, that we regard it both with horror, but a, a sort of fascination. And it does bring out the worst in people. I mean, we know how appallingly people can behave in war. And it also brings out the best. You know, if you read the memoirs of those who fought, so often they say, I have never felt such friendship in my life. I've never felt such comradeship. I would have died for my comrades and they would have died for me. It brings out a sort of selflessness which perhaps we don't see all that often in civilian society. We, we don't need it in the same ways as you do when you're fighting. And you get people doing extraordinarily brave things, people risking their lives, often giving up their lives. And so I think that's part of the mystery for me, that this thing, war, can produce such horror and, on the other hand, produce such bravery and, and such nobility in a way. It, it, it's a very complex subject. And I think... Like it or not, I think we remain fascinated by it. Um, and I think the other thing I think that's a mystery, and I tried to get at it, and, and much greater writers than I have tried to get, is how do you describe it? How do you really get over what it's like to fight in combat? And so often you, you get those who have fought saying, I can't really describe it. You know, it, it's an extraordinary feeling. Every, everything, what, something that comes out often is everything is much more intense. The light is more intense, the sounds are more intense. You're living more intensely. Um, I don't know if you ever saw, which I thought was a very good movie, The Hurt Locker, mm -hmm, about the bomb disposal yeah. expert. And you know, you 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 got a, a sense in that. I thought the director, Catherine Bigel Bigelow, carried brought it over very cleverly. That he felt alive when he was there, even though he was risking his life. And when he came back to the United States, he he just didn't feel alive in the same way. Mm -hmm. The last line of your book uh, reads: "We must more than ever think about war." How come? Why? Because I think war is still with us. And, you know, we've, any of us who've lived in Western societies or in the developed world more generally since 1945 have been extremely privileged. Very few of us have been touched by war in the ways in which our parents and grandparents were. Yet there are wars still all over the world. And there is always the possibility of war. And this, is, this is what worries me. You know, the, in, in 1914, the European powers most of them, people living in them, didn't really think there was going to be a war. They thought it's just a bit of posturing. We still live with the prospect of war. And for some people, more than the prospect, a lot of people in this world are still living with the actuality of war. And so we need to keep thinking about it. Why does it start? How can it be prevented? How can we limit it? How can we try and settle our disputes in other ways? We haven't got rid of war. War is still very much there. It, it, it's like the sort of, you know, the, 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 the bogey. In, in the attic. It's still there, and at any time it may cause real trouble. And that's why I think we need to think about it. And the specter of, of the future wars of the 21st, maybe 22nd centuries uh, with artificial intelligence and, and, and the like, rather terrifying. 
I think very terrifying. And I think, you know, I mean, one of the terrifying things is that we may end up with artificial intelligence actually running a war and human intervention no longer possible or no longer needed. And that I think is terrifying. What I think is also, it seems to me possibly, I may, I'll probably be wrong. Historians should never predict the future, but the future of war is going to be twofold. It's going to be the really high tech stuff. It's going to be the cyber war. It's going to be the war in space. It's going to be the drones. It's going to be artificial intelligence. But the other future of war is going to be what we're already seeing, these low level, miserable wars that drag on causing endless misery and devastation to civilians being fought with really very simple weapons. I mean, in Rwanda, during the, 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 the dreadful killings, they were using machetes and hoes. You know, you don't need very sophisticated weapons to fight wars. And we're seeing wars like that, wars that go on and on and on in the Great Lakes region of Africa, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. You know, I think, so we're going to see it, I think, a twofold future of war, the very high tech stuff, and then the other, which is just the one that is actually doing the damage at the moment. And my final question, what has this project, what, what has writing war, how conflict shaped us, what has it given you? What, what, what has been the, the, the gift, if I can call it that, of this project for you? I think I've learned a lot more about a subject that I was interested in, but perhaps in passing because I was looking at other things. And I think I've now got a, a sort of deeper understanding, I'd like to think, of, of the ways in which people relate to each other and understanding how they relate internationally, domestically, and understanding what war means, I think, is very much part of it. So I, I like to think I, I'm understanding history a bit better than I, than I did, um, because I now know more about a very important part of it. Well, you certainly helped me to understand war much better than oh. I did you know, before I started this book. Thanks so much, Margaret McMillan. It's, it's a delight speaking with you again. Well, it was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.